Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern, and today is Thursday, March 5th, 2020. Today's poem is by Howard Nemirov, whose 100th birthday would have been uh, last week. He was born on February 29th, 1920. Uh, Whenever someone's born on February 29th, it's worth pointing it out and remembering them. But of course, he was also one of the most celebrated American poets of the 20th century. He was twice the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress, and he won the National Book Award, the Bollingen Prize, and the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in uh, 1977, or at least for his collected poems of Howard Nemirov, which came out in 1977. He lived from 1920 to 1991. And the poem that I'm going to read today is called Learning the Trees, which came from that Pulitzer Prize winning collection, The Collected Poems of Howard Nemirov. It goes like this. Before you can learn the trees, you have to learn the language of the trees. That's done indoors, out of a book, which now you think of it as one of the transformations of a tree. The words themselves are a delight to learn. You might be in a foreign land of terms like Samara, Capsule, Droop, Lejeune, and Pom, where bark is papery, plated, warty, or smooth. But best of all are the words that shape the leaves, orbicular, cordate, cleft, and reniform. And their venation, palmate, and parallel, and tips, acute, truncate, auriculate, Sufficiently provided, you may now go forth to the forests and the shady trees to see how the chaos of experience answers to catalog and category. Confusedly. The leaves of a single tree may differ among themselves more than they do from other species, so you have to find, all blandly, says the book, an average leaf. Example. The catalpa in the book sprays out its leaves in whorls of three around the stem. The one in front of you but rarely does, or somewhat, or almost. Maybe it's not Catalpa? Dreadful doubt. It may be weeks before you see an elm fan-like in form, a spruce that pyramids, a sweet gum spiring up in steeple shape. Still, pedet emtim, as Lucretia says, little by little you do start to learn, and learn as well maybe what language does and how it does it, cutting across the world not always at the joints, competing with experience while cooperating with experience, and keeping an obstinate intransigence, uncanny of its own. Think finally about the secret will pretending obedience to nature, but invidiously distinguishing everywhere, dividing up the world to conquer it. And think also how funny knowledge is, You may succeed in learning many trees and calling off their names as you go by, but their comprehensive silence stays the same. So when I went to go check out some of the the details on his, on Nemirov's life, uh, like when he died and what year the, uh, his book won the Pulitzer Prize, for example, I went over to Wikipedia just to gather those details. And I started scanning his biography, as I sometimes do, checking out um, some of the the tidbits and the facts that are in there. Like, for example, that his younger sister was the photographer Diane Arbus, uh, which I did not know, strangely. Somehow I missed that. Um, and, you know, where he taught and where he lived and where he, where he died and things like that. And of course, it mentions that he was a formalist primarily. And um, there's a line in there that says that his work, quote, also has a reputation for being witty and playful. And I think that you can see that wittiness and that playfulness show up here. There's a lot going on in in this poem. There's there's a a series of four stanza poems uh, with a consistent meter. And uh, the, the formalism is is distinct the, you know there's even within the the formalism there's a distinct voice to the use of that form and part of that distinct voice is Nemirov's uh, sense of humor I think there's even a sort of wittiness in the way he drops in all the words that he drops in the, all the scientific terms like Samara and Lejeune and uh, Venation orbicular cleft reniform all the words that he that he mentions that you might learn 
But, uh, you know, I love the way th- that sense of humor also plays out in, <laughs> in the, the imagining of somebody learning all those terms and then going out and being so confused because, you know, what's in a science book isn't always the way things play out. Um, you know, in, in nature, there's, there's always the, the standard thing you're looking for, but nature has a way of throwing you for, for a loop and not giving you the thing that you're looking for. And there's that line in here that I, that I love that, that I find quite humorous where he says, well, this is a, I'll read the whole stanza to you. Confusedly, the leaves of a single tree may differ among themselves more than they do from other species. So you have to find all blandly, says the book, an average leaf. <laughs> and the poem seems to be suggesting that the nature of average itself should be called into question. The nature of average itself is a is while useful in terms of the science of it, less useful in terms of the art of nature, in the art of a leaf, the art of a tree. Or, I suppose you could extend it into, uh, if you want to talk on a, on a meta level, the art of, of a poem. And yet he says, although the concept of, of the average is, is uh, not always helpful, there is still the notion of how little by little you do start to learn. And then you learn as well the way language works. And so not just are you learning about the way trees work, but you're learning about the way language works. This is the, uh, the science of relations, I guess, as, as Charlotte Mason would put it. And I think this is a poem that explores that concept. After all, the way we learn is, uh, is we learn to make us to, to associate things in different subjects together. We learn to, to associate um, different ideas with one another, different images with one another. And those associations come to mean something. They come to be not just knowledge, but understanding, not just understanding, but, lo- but a sort of instinctual sense perception that helps us make sense of the world and know how to live in the world. Um, but in the midst of the sort of what seems like a, 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 the sort of chaos of learning, which Nemirov seems to be speaking to, there's also a form to it. And little by little you learn because one thing leads to another. Much like in a poem, what perhaps seems chaotic at first is bound by the form of the poem. Uh, so Nemirov is not just uh, witty and clever, he's also um, quite an interesting poet as, as well. One more time, here is Learning the Trees in uh, commemoration of Howard Nemirov's 100th birthday, which was on February 29th. Before you can learn the trees, you have to learn the language of the trees. That's done indoors, out of a book, which, now you think of it, is one of the transformations of a tree. The words themselves are a, a delight to learn. You might be in a foreign land of terms like Samara, Capsule, Droop, Lejeune, and Poem, where bark is papery, plated, warty, or smooth. But best of all are the words that shape the leaves, orbicular, cordate, cleft, and reniform, and their venation, palmate and parallel, and tips, acute, truncate, or auriculate. Sufficiently provided, you may now go forth to the forests and the shady streets to see how the chaos of experience answers to catalog and category. Confusedly, the leaves of a single tree may differ among themselves more than they do from other species, so you have to find, all blandly says the book, an average leaf. Example, the catalpa in the book sprays out its leaves in whorls of three around the stem, the one in front of you, but rarely does, or somewhat or almost. Maybe it's not a catalpa. Dreadful doubt. It may be weeks before you see an elm fan-like in form, a spruce that pyramids, a sweet gum spiring up in steeple shape. Still, pedetimtim, him, as Lucretius says. Little by little you do start to learn. And learn as well, maybe, what language does and how it does it, cutting across the world, not always at the joints, competing with experience while cooperating with experience, and keeping an obstinate intransigence, uncanny of its own. Think finally about the secret will pretending obedience to nature, but invidiously distinguishing everywhere, dividing up the world to conquer it. And think also how funny knowledge is. You may succeed in learning many trees and calling off their names as you go, but their comprehensive silence stays the same. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another poem for you.